Hello and thanks for joining us on today's show, The Master of the Literary Selfie. What writer becomes a sensation but also receives hate mail, death threats, provokes legal action and is disowned by members of his own family? Today's guest has revolutionised autobiographical fiction with six books provocatively entitled My Struggle after Hitler's Mein Kampf. It's three and a half thousand pages that chart the Norwegian writer's personal trials and tribulations from the hospitalisation of his wife with a breakdown, his father's alcoholism and his conflicted feelings about fatherhood, it ends with a meditation on Hitler. Let's meet Karl Ove Kunarsgaard. Carlo, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for That's being here. Introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it's been quite a journey um, to this moment. You published your first books in 2009, nearly a decade on. How are you feeling? I'm feeling very good, thank you. It's basically over for me. The hard part was the writing, you know. The, the pu publication of it is much, much easier and simpler and sometimes even fun. Your father dominates much of the work. Um, you tell us about his death in part one, a death in the family. Um, in book three, Boyhood Island, you show us what a tyrant he was, uh, how he used to send you to bed with no supper for really minor things like losing a sock. Um, he actually drank himself to death. I feel like I know so much about um, your life and him. Um, why did you want to share sometimes very humiliating things with everyone? I never thought like that, you know. Uh... What I wanted to do was the beginning of this, uh, uh, this, uh, these books were uh, my father's death. He was not an alcoholic when I grew up, but he became an alcoholic when I was an adult and he died under kind of brutal circumstances. And it made such an impression on me, I wanted to write about it, but I couldn't find a way of doing that because I tried to write it as fiction. And then I had this kind of, it was almost like I gave up everything. I've tried for, for many years to tell that story. And I just thought, okay, I don't want to bother with literature. I just write it as it was, you know. I'm not sure any writer has generated so much discussion as you have over the past 10 years. Um, and, and what about the title as well, Min Kampf, um, or My Struggle? It's a reference to Hitler's notorious autobiography. Yeah. I mean, why would you choose a title like that? It's a perfect title because it's so ironic. I mean, My Struggle of Hitler, it's, you know, it's, it's his image of himself as a as a world saviour and, it, and it's all about perfection and it's all about you know making the world perfect and this book my struggle is a tiny 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 struggle you know about everyday things banalities raising children doing mistakes blushing all those kind of things so that there is a gap between my struggle and my struggle which is the book you know that that's that's where it's it's happening in in that space you know and it feels quite male dominated your work. In book three you write, male status, pride and dignity revolve around what other men think, women don't count. Um, your mum seems to be in the background. We hear a lot about your dad. Yeah. Uh, why don't women count? Yeah, of course they do. These, <laughs> these books are, um, you know, when I'm 17 in the book, I'm writing how I'm thinking when I'm 17. And I'm always try to to be as honest as possible. So it's not like I'm making statements. These are things that go through my mind. This is things I believed when I was, you know, eight or 10 or 12 or, or, or 40. So the thing is, I wanted it you to be able to see how an opinion is created and how, you know, society is created inside of you. So there's no way I kind of back that, uh, um, that statement in the book. My mother is in the background for many reasons. Uh, one is that she's still alive. Two is that, and that's strange because I was so close to her and I can't really hear her because I'm so close to her. And there were two other persons I found very difficult to write about. It was my editor and my wife and my mother. And I realized after writing about them why that was, because they were giving, you know, they were giving, giving. It's hard to see and it's hard to hear people who gives you know it's easy to 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 um, be observant of people who take things away from you or in conflict with you but that kind of giving thing is is hard to 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 see and what about um, writing i mean in one of the books you leave your first wife and marry a, a, your second wife a poet um your first wife must have discovered lots of things that you'd done um infidelities things she didn't know about i mean what was that like what was her reaction like 
Um, what did you think about it? Yeah, it was was very difficult for almost everybody I wrote about, and and uh, and especially for her. So she did a radio documentary about how it was to be in the book. So she interviewed me about it, uh, and she 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 tried to take her story back because I, I think that was the the worst thing for her was the feeling that I took our story f- and used it for my own purposes, you know. Uh, we're friends now. I mean, I mean, but it was very, very hard with almost all my relations while I was doing it. And I mean, you're married with four children. You talk about the difficulties of having young children, um, how you resent being a new man. When I look at a beautiful painting, I have tears in my eyes, but not when I look at my children. When you were writing about your children, did you think yeah. about them reading it and what they might feel in the future? Mm. Yeah, I did. And that was maybe the hardest part of, of doing it. But I... You know, they are almost as old that they could read it now. My oldest is 13, but they're not they're not interested at all. They know about the book and they know they're in the book. And what I thought when I was writing it was that, you know, they are only children. They are not, they are like two or three years when they, they're a figure in the book. Uh, but the thing for them is, of course, that I have given away our story, you know, to the world. Uh, but on the other hand, they have a father where they... I never knew what my father was thinking. I never knew what was going on in his mind. And at least they do know that if they read the book. And it's full of love. I mean, I don't think it could be that destructive if it's full of love, which it is. Well, the books have been greeted with lots of controversy. Um, And while you're here, you're going to meet some readers at the bookshop Shakespeare & Co. We asked one of the staff at the shop, though, why they think your work is so divisive. Carlo Nasgard. Because he, because he tells us everything, he tells us all of the, the dark thoughts as well as all of the noble thoughts. So if you want to find some, some of the unpleasant characteristics that, are, that exist in all of us, then you can find them in his writing. And I think that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Five of the books are out in English. The sixth one um, is coming out next year. It's a, and it contains a 400 page essay about Adolf Hitler's childhood. Um, and has a discussion about the massacre in 2011 by the far-right terrorist Anders Breivik. Um, you almost try and humanise Hitler. At one stage, you actually write, Hitler's youth resembles my own, talking about your own. Um, you're clearly going to come under fire for this. Why try and humanise Hitler? Because he was a human being. Uh, I didn't plan that either. I didn't even plan to write about him. It was because of the title uh, of my book. I thought I have to read Hitler's book, and I did. So, and I thought I had to write about that. And then I kind of, you know, disappeared into it and, and, uh, and discovered a lot of things that I think is relevant still now for us. And the one thing, most important thing is that, you know, uh, what happened during the war or before the war in Germany uh, was done by, you know, normal people like me and you. So I think if you pull it through and realize it could have been me, you are in a much more interesting and much more true position. And you could see things can happen in, in, a, in a, like it happened in, in Germany easily, you know. There is, a, there is a crisis in society and someone rises up and, and uses that crisis, you know, to, to do something um, terrible. And we're in a time um, when there's an international wave of hard right populism. Marine Le Pen in France, Donald Trump and Nigel Farage in the UK. And what do you think about the current climate? I think it somehow it is. Uh, it reminds me of, of of the climate before before the war. Not in, but but somehow it does because it is a crisis and it is a right wing, you know, rising. And I think the dangerous thing is that we change the way we are talking about it. You know, we are accepting things and are pushing boundaries. We are accepting it, pushing boundaries, accepting it. That was what happened in Germany. You know, there is a brilliant, brilliant. Uh, um, book about that by one called Klemper, who was in Germany, and he was a linguist, so it's about language, what happened with language in Germany. Acceptance of what's happening started in language, you know. And that is something that is going on right now. It's not going to the extreme, but you can see the way we're talking about things are changing, you know. Your books have been translated into many languages, and people all around the world, they know about the time you slashed your face with broken glass when you were rejected by... Um, your future wife, the fierce rages of your father, his alcoholism, um, your blackouts from alcoholism when you were growing up, your infidelities, how you dislike being a new man when it came to um, looking after your kids. 
How does it feel that knowing that thousands of people think they know you? Do I, they know you? Uh, no, they, <laughs> they, they do a little bit, yeah, but I, I kind of uh, I deny it. I don't think about it. It never occurred to me that someone knows anything about me uh, when I meet someone. It's like I, I'm, I'm, I'm just blocking that out. I can't deal with it. I'm writing books and you know it's, it's, it's very personal for me. And then I just ignore what's happening outside of me. And you've actually chosen um, Kifa, because uh, I know you're into art, um, mm. to end our show. He's got an exhibition coming up here in Paris at the Rodin Museum. Why do you like him? Oh, that's, uh, he has always made a, a, a huge impression on me. Uh, I never you know, found out why, I just love it. But then I was in a wonderful exhibition in uh, London called Valhalla this winter. It's, a, it's an amazing exhibition and there's no human faces in us, no, no humans at all. It's only the things that we leave behind. So it's like he's creating a huge, huge space for, for what's going on in the world now. It's hard to explain, but it was like I had this, um, yeah, it was like, it was so touching. And I thought that's not possible because there's no hum human beings there, but it was. Okay, well, you can see the exhibition at the Rodin Museum in Paris until October. Carlo Vey, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Nice to be here. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here. Your sixth book is coming out in English next year, and your third book, Boyhood Island, will be out in French in September. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. So we can see.